So no matter what you say, I could have expanded my house. Why you never did that before? Well, because I, I didn't know that there was a problem. But then when you told me there was a problem, now I know that I can expand my house. All right, so we're in the book of Revelation. You know, that song that we just finished was, out in, well, actually two of the songs tonight made me think, I guess it's because my mind's on the book of Revelation, and so therefore on the beloved disciple, known otherwise known as John. Amen? John wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote the letter to the seven churches known as the book of Revelation. The, the, script, the psalm where it was talking about, I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay my head on your chest, and fill your heart beat. The reason that I thought of John was because that sounds like the story that we read in the Gospels of John. People don't understand, especially men have a hard time understanding being that close to another man. You know, because, I mean, when you're manly, and then if you, if you understand that, I mean, when you want to try to be manly, uh, and, and, you know, then it's, it comes across as weird, okay, to be that close to another man. But then if you if you want to be that close to a man, typically it may be considered, well, I mean, let's just call it a little bit perverted because it's, it's not right. But whenever it's Jesus and the relationship to understand the love of the Lord, it's a whole different thing. It's, a, it's God's love. Amen. And when you when you have an intimate relationship with the Lord because he breaks through and he begins to move and reveal his love, it's actually it's a beautiful thing. But until a person uh, can can be has experienced the love of God that way, it makes it a difficult thing to understand. But I just want to encourage you to know that John John had a special relationship with Jesus. They say that three of the disciples were close were closest to him <clears throat> out of, you know, there were, there were 70 at one time. He sent them out two by two. And then the, the 12 were closer than the 70. And then within the 12, there was three that were close. It was, it was John, Andrew, and Peter. And then within the three, it was John. He was the closest. He was the one that stayed by his side the longest. But he also fleed and fled in the end. And so that's, that's, the, that's who wrote this letter uh, <clears throat> to, the church of, to the churches of Revelation. He's the one that wrote this letter, and uh, you know where he writes the letter. It's going to explain it in here. I won't be able to show you on the map, but where he wrote it was at a place called the Isle of Patmos. Now, the Isle of Patmos, Patmos was actually a prison island. Okay, so John, the beloved, the disciple known as John the Beloved, was exiled to a island. Okay, I still got my I still got my chalk, and I still got my chalk. So what I will do is I will try to write you a big old map so that you can see it. And so this is Israel. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And this would be Asia Minor would look something like this. And then we come down to Greece like this. And so here we have uh, the Aegean Sea over this one. The Aegean Sea is over this way. And, and this whole area here is known as Asia Minor, and I can't really tell you exactly where these churches would be, but they would they would fill up. The Asia Minor comes around this way, and I probably made this too big, but you get the point. There were seven churches that would have been interspersed throughout this area, and down here somewhere was a little bitty island in the Aegean Sea, and it was called the Isle of Patmos, and it was a prison island. And the early church fathers said that John was exiled to that island. He was exiled there for preaching the gospel. He was exiled to this prison uh, island for preaching the gospel. He had been the pastor of the church of Ephesus. He was the bishop over all of these churches. And he was exiled there and he was mining. They, they made him go into a, you know, to work in a mine. And then when he was released, he came back and, and he preached and he led, you know, led the churches some more. And that was that's some of the stories, you know, some beautiful stories when you hear about the about the love the, the the beloved disciple. They say towards the end of his life he was so old that they would have they would bring him out to a tree where they have church outside, and he they would lean him up against the tree and, and he would just say, he would just say, Love one another. Is what they is what they, the church fathers would write. And he would say, Love one another like the Lord loved us. But when he would say it, what they, what they wrote about was that there was so much power, so 
so much anointing from the Holy Spirit that it would reach and grip a hold of men's hearts. Because you got to understand something. This disciple walked with him. He talked with him. And, and he, he took the time to really listen to what it was. That he was saying. And he learned from the Lord. And they say that when he said those words, it was just so powerful. So I want you to know that, that you know, he was exiled on this island. And so let's go ahead and get started. And we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. The first thing that I want you to understand when it comes to the book of Revelation is that this revelation... Is it hearing some kind of weird sound? They're drumming. Oh, they're, they're drumming. I thought it was a vibration from no. me talking. No, I think they're like okay. drumming. That, that's fine. That's all right. She's, she's always trying to help me. <laughs> so <laughs> it is so he says, look at it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, first off, I look it's gonna be a verse by verse study, and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of go through the book of Revelation pretty pretty slow. We're gonna take it verse by verse, but I'm gonna try not to overdo it. But I want you to know that the word revelation by itself, I know I've already explained it before, but the word in the Greek is apocalypsis or apocalypsis is where we get the word apocalypse from. Now many times when we hear the word apocalypse, I don't know if you're a word person, I am, you think of catastrophe, you think of you think of war, you think of chaos and, and trouble. And yes, there's that element to it, but the literal meaning of the word means an unveiling. It means to show something that was previously covered. So sometimes things are obscured and then they're uncovered. So the word revelation, that's where we get the word revelation. Lord, give me revelation. Let me see. Amen. So that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ here. And so what I want you to understand is, is this, is that right now you and I have a revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. You wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't have some sort of a revelation of Jesus Christ. We might, some of us might have a little more by the grace of God of revelation, but we all, to some extent, have revelation. Amen. What this book is talking about is talking about the truth and the fact that, guess what? One day, even in this chapter, if I'm not mistaken, it says it, one day every eye will see him. So I want you to know that sometimes whenever you are being a witness for the Lord and you're talking to certain people and they're not getting it and they don't agree with you, you know what? The Lord has called us to be light in the midst of darkness. I got to tell you, though, that one day there, all the guesswork is going to be over. It's going to be, he's going to be unveiled. The world will know that this story was true. You understand what I'm trying to get at? Like you're, and hopefully you're a disciple tonight. I believe that most of the time people on Wednesday nights are trying to be a disciple, which means to be a learner of Christ, which is different than the church goer. And I'm not kicking on church goers, they're just in a different place than the disciple. Amen. And as you become a disciple and a learner of Christ, and you get more and more revelation, and you try to tell others about it, but I'm here to tell you that there's going to come a day when all the guesswork's going to be out, and all those that scoffed and laughed and did not believe, it, it, it's going to be too late at that yeah. And the book of Revelation is talking about that. It's talking about this is the great unveiling. This is that last seven-year period that we talked about when we were in Daniel. You remember that? Whenever I broke down all those numbers and I probably put you to sleep. But now that we've covered it, we can talk fluently about it. Daniel chapter 9. The, 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 the angel Gabriel came and said, Daniel, from the beginning when you started to pray, your prayers were heard, but the prince of Persia restrained me. And, and guess what? There are 77s determined upon your people. Seventy. Seven-year period is determined upon your people. And when you calculate it out, it was 490 years. And the 490 years started whenever the king of Persia told them that they could go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. He says, from that time until the cutting off of Messiah was the first portion. That was 483 years. That means there's a seven-year period left. Seven-year period, an outlier that has not been reached, that has not been accomplished because we've been in the midst of the church age. And then with, the, then, then with the stroke of a pen, we've already talked about this, the Antichrist is going to sign a covenant with many, talking about Israel. And when he signs that covenant, that is what the act that begins that last seven-year period stops. And some people say it's the rapture. No, no, it's not. That's right. It's the Daniel chapter 9, when they signs the covenant, is what begins the last seven-year period that we're waiting to see, which opens up. 
when the first seal will also be opened up at that point in time and the Antichrist will rise to power and he will begin his process of deception that's all preparing the way in order for Jesus to come back and to make things right. And it says in the middle of that seven, he's, that Antichrist is going to break that covenant. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. See, God the Father gave the revelation to Jesus. It's Jesus' revelation. It's the unveiling of Jesus. Not, I'm not talking about the one that was born as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. I'm not talking about the one that was a carpenter's son in, in his earthly role. I'm not talking about the one that, that humbly received the crown of thorns upon his head. No, and, and, and allow Roman soldiers to blindfold him and to slap him and to pull the beard out and to strike him with, with a stick on his head and to say, now that you're blindfolded, prophesy who it is that strikes you, son of man, dressed in your royal regalia with your purple robe on and your little crown of thorns. Go ahead. Go ahead and, and, and you know, tell us who it is that strikes you. You know, that's not the Jesus I'm talking about. I'm talking about the resurrected. We're talking about the one that's coming back on a white horse. And then not to be confused with the first one that's coming on a white horse. Jesus is coming back at the end. He's coming back to destroy the faker. All right. And that's the revelation. But God the Father gave the understanding to Jesus. And, look, and it's going to go on to say the reason why he gave it to him was in verse 1. To show it to his servants. Now I want to focus on that word servant for a second. I think once we... Get through some of these words that I wanted to point out tonight. We're going to get moving, okay? I want you to know the word servant is doulos. In the Greek, that means a bond slave. Now, I want you to know that a Greek slave was a little bit different than a Hebrew slave. But I believe that the truth lies to both of them. All right, I'm not going to even go on to the year of Jubilee and whenever the bond slave was released in the book of Exodus. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But what I do want you to know is... Is that the Roman type slave of what this is talking about when it speaks of a bond slave? It comes from the word bound, a bound man. So what does it mean to be bound? It means it means to to belong to another. See, and one of the things that I want you to know is this: the Scripture says, in Paul wrote in Corinthians that you are not your own, that you were bought with a price. And the Scripture says you were not your own; you were bought with a price. 1 Peter 1.18 says, see, Paul said that in Corinthians, but what, what Peter says in 1 Corinthians, I mean, 1 Peter 1.18 is this, is that you were not redeemed, which means to be purchased. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but instead by the precious blood of a lamb which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. So what I want you to know is, is that you don't belong to yourself. You can't make your own decisions. You can't just go out there and say, oh, yeah, I can do whatever it is that I want. The Lord's going to forgive it. No, you can't because you've been purchased. If you truly are a servant of the Lord, if you are a do loss of God, if you are a, the word should be translated as a slave. The New King James translates it that way. So for the newer translation, listen, you if you are a slave of the Lord, I ain't going to be no man's slave. Will you, 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 will you be God's slave? Will you willingly submit your life to the Lord? Because I can tell you this. I learned this, some of this the hard way. As you and I rest with God, it's just a short version of wrestle. When you and I wrestle with God, and, and, we, and, we're, and I said it Sunday, whenever I was doing all that kicking and screaming, Right? When you and I have a toddler mentality towards surrendering to God and we demand to have our way, we just prolong the problem. Yeah, amen. Because, see, once you say, Lord, I want to be yours, you may not understand it, but look, now that blood's been applied to the doorpost of your heart, guess what? You don't belong to yourself anymore. That's right. Should be told when you gave your heart to Jesus without really realizing, but I didn't know what I was signing, Lord. But guess what? You asked the Lord to come in, and He is committed yes. to being the way maker in your life, to being the promise keeper in your life, to being the light in the midst of the darkness. He's committed that even though He's going to create scenarios that are going to cause frustration and, and, and aggravation sometimes in your life, He is committed to working on you and chipping away and molding the vessel that his spirit can live within. He knows exactly your makeup. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows exactly what it is that you need. He 
knows how to prepare a gumbo just right for you. A gumbo is just a soup of a bunch of different meat. He knows how to prepare those life circumstances that are just perfect for you. Because he knows how, listen, you know how sometimes whenever you get to know somebody really, really well, next thing you know, they, they know how to press your button. God knows exactly how to press your button, better than any human being in this world. And he knows how to get a hold of us, amen? And what I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that if you truly belong to the Lord, you got to understand you were bought. You were, you were bought. You don't Amen. belong to yourself anymore. Amen? Amen. So I want you to know that. And so that's the whole point: is that God the Father revealed the revelation of what Jesus, the, the exposing of Jesus, was going to look like, so that Jesus could give it to His servants. He wants you and I to understand the words that are going to be in this book as we move through this this letter, this book, whatever we want to call it. As we move through this visual imagery that God gave to this. Beloved apostle, while he was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, I need you to know that God wants you, his servants, to know this, right? And things which must come shortly to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, you know, this is a, I, I, man, I probably look at these things too closely and get a little deep. People are probably like, man, just move forward. But, I, you know, look at this. I mean, signified it by his angel. Unto his servant John. I mean, it's like, you know, people say, I mean, he can, I don't think he can really prove this, you know, but everybody's got an angel. Yeah. I don't think that we can really prove that. You know, it's a, it's a neat little thought. But I do know that the nations have angels. That's right. Like, we already, we already covered that. I do know that Michael's the archangel of Israel. But right here, it's saying that Jesus, Jesus has an angel. Jesus has an angel that, and you know, I know that a bunch of angels ministered to him when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. But look, the angel sent it to his servant John while he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos so that he would have the understanding and of this so that you and I who are the servants or slaves of the Lord could receive this truth. It says, you bore record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Yeah, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I'm asking you to think in your mind. Have you read the book of Revelation yet? I mean, I hope you have. This was the first book that I read. It just happened to be that way. I don't know why I did, but this is the first book of the Bible I read. I was working on a supply boat in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere. And I, this is the first. I remember I was on a boat with two Christians. And, and I was like, man, I just got saved, dude. From the, right after I got saved, I went on this boat for two weeks, and these two guys, the Lord knows how to take care of your life, man. He put me on a supply vessel with two guys that were from down the body in Galliano, and they were like, Clark was one of his name, Clark and Nancy. Dude, I'm 54 years old. I was 19 when I got on that boat, and I still remember the dude's name. <laughs> and and I'm Clark and Nancy. And I can remember when they were talking about Jesus, and I'm like, dude, I just gave my heart to Jesus, right? And my sister was a Christian, you know, whatever. I had my long hair. I thought I was all cool. And they said, well, what you reading in the Word? I said, dude, I'm reading the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't think you were supposed to read that. Like, I like it. And you know what? But I want you to see this. Look. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of his prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Yes, sir. The Lord said, blessed are those that read this book. Right? Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord, bless me. Amen. I don't need you to bless me, but I need him to bless me. I want his hand of blessing on my life. I want his hand of protection on my life. I want the Lord to pour out wisdom and understanding. I want him to give me an open window in heaven. And I want him to just give me a down style of grace and knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Because you know what? If I be a friend of the Lord, if I walk hand in hand with the Lord, amen, the one who loved me and died for me, I don't have to worry about my enemies. Come on. Lord, don't let my enemies triumph over me. That's what David wrote in the song. Don't let my enemies triumph over me, Lord. Amen. Lord. The Lord, he'll take care of me. Yeah. Yes, yes. So this message is given to John to the seven churches which are in Asia, Asia Minor, which I was trying to draw a map for you up there, but I don't think it is a very good map. But it's okay. 
Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was. So let me just slow down a little bit. Grace and peace unto you. You know the Apostle Paul started most of his letters this way? Grace and peace be unto you. In that song, I don't even remember the words now. I forgot the lyric. It was the second to last song that they were singing. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup of your hand, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep. It's all that I can stand. It's overwhelming. I melt in your peace. That's what I was trying to get to. I melt in your peace. If you ain't never melted in the peace of the Lord, then you yeah. don't really understand yeah. what I'm trying to say. Here, and that's the thing, my friend. You can sing about it. You can sing with the band. You can read the lyrics on the monitor. But if you ain't never melted in the peace of the Lord, then you ain't never experienced what peace is supposed to feel like. That's right. That's I'm right. talking about it. It could be a hurricane outside, a storm blowing in your life. Everything falling apart. But boy, when the peace of God shows up. Oh, he'll calm everything. He'll speak to your heart. He'll make himself so, so real to you. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. In the worst storms of my life, the peace of the Lord mm. has just melted my heart. Amen. The most painful times of all of oh, yes. the peace of the Lord showed up. Amen. And melted Glory my heart. to God. It's yes. good. The yes. Lord's good. Amen. You hear me? Amen. Don't give up on him, right. Christian. Oh, the devil's going to try to pull all his stops. He hates you and he hates the God that you serve. I'm going to tell you right now. If you can know it, thank God he hates you. Thank God the Lord don't let us see how, how ruthless he is. How that ruthless that enemy is. I'm telling you right now, he hates you and I. And he will, not, he will not stop. He will try everything within him to stop us. And to get us to turn our back on the Lord. Now, don't, you, don't you let go. I'm telling you right now. The Lord has a peace. That surpasses understanding. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you from him which is and was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. You know, I, I can tell you right now there's not seven holy spirits. I can tell you right now that there's not. That would be blasphemy. Now, now I'm not trying to be mean, but be me in. I watched the video all the time and, and I'm not going to get weird on you, but, it, but this is what he was doing. He was saying, I see it now. I see it. There's seven of them. There's seven Holy Spirit. No, no, no. There's not seven Holy Spirit. Seven. There's not. And you're really not supposed to be going around blowing on people the way that you do. You're not. You're just not. Okay. It's not. Yes. Jesus blew one. And yes, they received the Holy Ghost when Jesus blew one. But anyway, let me not get into that. That's not the point. There are seven attributes according to Isaiah of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of understanding. The number seven is the number of fulfillment. It was on the seventh day that God. The seventh day was the Sabbath. The Sabbath means the day of rest. Jesus is ultimately the fulfillment of our rest. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is, wants to bring about a fulfillment. Amen. And the work that he does will continue to bring us to a place of fulfillment until he comes back for us. Amen. And he turns this corruptible. I'm sorry. This, this, yeah. This corruptible into his glory. Amen. Before his throne. And from Jesus Christ... Who is the faithful witness? Well, I like that right there, too. I'm, I'm, I promise you, I'm going to keep going in a second. But, you know, the faithful witness. Amen? I don't know if that hit you or not, but it hit me. He's the faithful witness. I always got to tell you that, I was, that, I'm, that I'm the faithful witness. But guess what? As much as I love Jesus and as much as I want through his grace and understand that I want to be the faithful witness, I can tell you right now, I'll fail the Lord. And if you think you ain't found the Lord, then you already ain't the faithful witness. Lord, I, I want to be, I want to emulate my Jesus, and I can't do it without your help, That's Lord. Right. Amen? Yeah. But he was the faithful witness. And you know that word witness is where we get the word martyr from. That's where the word martyr comes from. Now, the word martyr literally does mean one that will give his life to the point of death. Mm -hmm. You know how much scripture we say tonight? We say a lot of scripture. When you get to Revelation 5, you will see... They overcame him. How did they overcame him? Who are, first of all, who are they overcoming? Then the song the said. Huh? The enemy. the enemy. They overcame him. The devil. The lion dragon. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their own lives even unto death, emulating the life of their faithful witness, the king of kings, the lord of lords, he was faithful until the end. He never quit. He never gave up. 
Sometimes yeah. whenever I feel tired and I feel like giving up, guess what? I did. I try to remember. I remember Jesus. And I, yeah, I was offshore one time. I, I need to hustle up. But I was offshore one time witnessing to this dude. This was before the Lord got a hold of me. This was my second job in the world. And I was talking about Jesus, man. I was up there. I used to dip. I had that dip in my lip. And I was like, man, look, dude. I used to do this, 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 and this. And Jesus changed me, man. And this guy was, this guy was loud. I mean, rally according to my standards. And one day he said, what about that dip in your lip? You over there preaching? What about that dip in your lip? I was like, man, it's hard. He said, yeah, I bet it was hard when old Jesus was carrying that cross up on you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't sleep that night. You know, but he knew because, see, I didn't realize that the Lord had already tried to touch him and had ministered to him. You know, that's kind of sad. I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, that guy died, man. I, I saw him later in jail. He was he was born of a millionaire, this guy. Just goes to show you. His dad, his dad was dirt poor from Oklahoma, and his dad came up, just had a mine in the oil field, and created a multi-million dollar overseas business. And these boys had they they were both they could have had anything that they wanted. Hmm. And and they both allowed sin in and I worked with him one time offshore, and then I saw him again when I was going to the jail to minister Jesus. Dude, I'll never forget the first day I walked up in that jail, but anyway, that's another story. And one day I'm preaching to the crowd, and there he was in the back, and I mean, he was all swole up, and he was just this <clears throat> gung-ho for life is what he ever was. I even sent him a, an expositor's Bible that I wrote him one time, and then when he got out, he went straight back to drugs, and his brother ended up shooting him in the chest. Mm -hmm. Sad, man. It just goes to show you. It goes to show you a life when you never know an encounter that you're going to end up having right, with right. someone, and you never know the choices that we make and the detours that our lives can take. But anyway, I was just trying to say he's the faithful witness. He's faithful, amen. 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 And he gave his life. He was the, he was the first martyr. Jesus was. I mean, the first martyr for the New Testament for sure. And the first begotten of the dead. So not only did he die, but he was also the first one to rise again. Amen? The first begotten of the dead. Because he is the resurrection and the life. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's what he told the sisters. You remember the sisters, Martha and Mary. Can't remember which one exactly it was. But he told her, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Your brother will live again. And, and it's just the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. You know, whenever I look at this today and real closely... It said, look, look at this. It says, from Jesus, who is the faithful martyr. Let's just go ahead and say it. He's the faithful martyr, right? And he's the first begotten of the dead. So he died, he resurrected, amen? And look at this. And he's the prince of the kings of the earth. This is talking about his first coming, his dying, his resurrection, and the fact that he's coming back again. And when he comes back again, he's going to rule and reign on this earth, he is he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Unto him that loved us. Boy, look at this. You know, you could this this verse right here, this just preaches all by itself if you slow down a little bit. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sin. Yes, sir. Thank in you, his Jesus. Own I mean, how do you get out of that? You gotta lick, you gotta tone your voice down. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 6, and he's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You know, before I lose my train of thought, I just want to say something. He made us, you and I, kings and priests unto our God and unto his Father. And look at this, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I don't know, amen, I don't know what other creatures, I mean, again, I'm not trying to, they got some good preachers out there, I realize. And I hope, whenever the Spirit of God is exposing the scriptures for the way that they're written, then we're all going to be on the same page. Yeah. But I can tell you that I, all preachers that are standing behind pulpits have a revelation and an understanding that we're supposed to be building the kingdom and the dominion of Jesus. This is his kingdom. The Father gave it to Jesus, amen? And that's what we're supposed to be building. So Jesus is the one that's supposed to be exalted. 
Jesus is the one that's supposed to be prayed. Jesus is the one that is supposed to be lived for and served and surrendered to and allow our life to be humble yeah. in his presence. But look, he loves you. And he has made you to be kings and priests. You can turn with me real quick to Revelation 5.10. Revelation 5, 10. Look, look, look. He's going to go. He's going to say it again. And he has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. So I don't know what your position or your station in life on earth has been in this temporary thing we call the vapor of life. But I can tell you right now, if you will serve him. I know you're not, you, can't, you can't motivate people with flesh and game because that's not. Because this is a spiritual thing. Because you can't see eternity. You can't see the celestial city with your physical eye. But the more you, the close, the more I seek Him, the more I find Him. Yeah. The more I find Him, the more I love Him. The more you, the more you seek after the Lord, the more He exposes and allows you to see more of Him. Yeah. The more you see of Him, because see, He's working in your life. The more he reveals himself to you that way, the more you're going to love him. Yes. And when you begin to love him on this earth, the more he's going to use you. And the more he uses you according to the word of the Lord, there's a crown that's being produced. Amen. And the good news is, see, we used to talk whenever I first got saved. Some people talk about, man, I'm getting a crown, dude. I'm working for the Lord. But you know what I started to realize? <coughs> that whenever I have my crown. That what I'm going to end up doing with that crown is whenever I get into the presence of my Lord, hallelujah, I'm going to take it off and I'm going to lay it at his feet. Amen. 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 And, and I'm going to be really, I don't understand it all, but I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be really, really, really happy to do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to be really happy <laughs> to lay that crown at the feet of my Lord. Amen. So I just want you to see that, that he has made us. Unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. And this is what they were saying with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good. Amen. He's so worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, and you know, if we can't, if for some reason we can't see it right now, you know, Lord, help us to see it. Amen. Help us to see how worthy you are. Yes, Lord. And, and, and thank you. That you, you know, I, I used to say this a lot when, when the Lord first started giving me revelation. God has allowed us to enter the game. I mean, Jim, I'm using this as an illustration. Jesus already warned you. Amen. Done deal, score 100 to 0, enemy loses, okay? But the beautiful thing is, is that God doesn't make us, you know, the way Dad used to say it, don't ride the pine, boy. What does that mean? Don't sit on the bench. Don't let that coach put you on the bench. I want to see you over there aggravating him. And when he finally gives you your shot, you better make something happen. So the point is, is this, is that God, Jesus has already won the war, but he's allowing you and I to engage in the battle. Yeah, yeah. See, and, and I don't know about you, but I hope that you will be able to get to a place in your spiritual walk one day that you will be able to appreciate that. Yeah. What does that look like for me in my life? How is that relevant for my life today? You learn, to, I'm going to tell you what it is. You become a disciple. You become a do loss. You, you understand that you, you're not your own and that you belong to the Lord. And you avail yourself to learn his word. Because guess what? I'm like the girl I was, I hope you're watching. The girl that cut my hair today, I told her today, I said, I'm starting to feel like you're my sister in the Lord. She said, that excites me. And I said, let me, let, me, let me just tell you something. The more you learn the word of God, the more it starts to change your mind. I said, you know what? And this is the first time I've ever said this. The word of God is displacing. And I'm, I chose that word real quick. Yeah. I meant it. It's displacing my previous life. Well, what are you talking about? You ever heard of displacement before? You fill up a cup of water and it's full to the top and you stick a heavy object in it. What happens? All of the volume that that heavy object contains causes that much water to flow out. 
The more of God I put on the inside of me is displacing all that cultural, I like to call that cultural, all that cultural garbage that I learned from my grandparents. I love my grandparents. I love me some Nita Deloney, even though one time she told me, Matt, you're getting fat. Okay. <laughs> she was just telling the truth, brother. Maybe that's where I got it from. She was, and she was true. I was chunky. Okay. And so, so listen, I love me some Nita. I love me some Momo. But guess what? I learned a bunch of culture from the people that wasn't of the Lord. I mean, I love you, but I learned some culture from my parents. Guess what? But now the word of the Lord through the Holy Ghost is put is displacing all of that. That's good. It's not the will of God that I sit in a darkened tavern and play cards for money and get drunk to the late midnight hour. It's not God's will that I sing a Hank Williams Jr. song and talk about, oh, it's just a family tradition. Come on, Solos. Leave me alone. This is what we do. No, 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 no. This ain't what we do. Not when we give our heart to the Lord. Not when Jesus has to live on the inside and the Holy Spirit's living there and he's creating a tabernacle in the tent where he can live. No, you don't keep doing all that. You got a new tradition. You got a new family. There's a new spirit living on the inside. He's changing you and he's molding you. And he's enculturating you. And he's displacing the stuff that was in you. And he's replacing it with something new. Hallelujah. And I told her that. And she was so receptive. And I said, you know something? Before you finish your haircut, I got to tell you something. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you about the scripture. And you know, it all started when I started telling her about Jesus. So look, one day, at her old place where she was working, she made a comment. She was talking to her friend. You remember how I was saying about them cat people? And I don't even know what she said. Two sentences. I said, that ain't no cat people, my friend. What you're describing right there is something called the Nephilim. What you're describing right there is the mind. What you're describing right there is demon spirits. And I told her the story in the book of Genesis. And she was like, oh my God. And started weaving it all together. She said, I've been looking for answers. And, and since then, it ain't ever been the same. I'm telling you right now, you don't know what it is that the Lord's going to open up the door. And then guess what? She don't need just me because one day she couldn't sleep. She turns on the TV. She don't know who the preacher is. Three o'clock in the morning, she turns on the TV and some man preaching the gospel. And, it's, and he says, no, this is for you. And the man looked at the TV and told her that. Yes. <laughs> this is for you. And she said, I knew he was talking to me. I mean, listen, he pointed at the TV. There might have been 10,000 people. But when the Holy yes, Spirit went yes, to well, yes, yes. and he let you know, yes, oh, no, he really, no, really, really, he's talking to you. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yep. And I'm telling you right now, this, this lady's life is being changed Thank by you. the grace of God. Amen. 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 Anyway, he's made us kings and priests unto our God and to his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. See, we're supposed to be exalting and preaching Jesus. And as long as I got breath in my lungs and the grace of God flowing in my life, that's what I want to do. I want to exalt Jesus. Amen. Because people yes. need to know this Jesus. Yes. Amen. And he wants to use you. I think that was one of the big parts I was trying to say. He allows you to get into the game. Amen. He doesn't want you sitting on the bench. He wants, and that's really how this message is relevant for your life. Because in the secret sense of the church that we live in, in the midst of society, they're like, how is this relevant for me, preacher? I listen, I haven't been there, dude. I went to Bible college. And I was listening, and I was in the class, and I remember the preach the, the guy that was teaching a biblical preaching class. He said, he said, if you don't hit their felt need in the first twenty minutes, mm. what would that? What, what, what is a felt need? Okay. I'm just trying to tell you right now. I mean, like Mike's going, Mike, you're going through some stuff in your life, right? Robert's going through some stuff in your life. Sabrina, I know Sabrina's got to be going through some stuff in your life. She doesn't call me up every day and tell me exactly what's going. I'm sure Jessica and Dick, I'm sure, I'm sure Ed Lee and the rest of that's going on in her life, right? I mean, not yet today. How crazy is that? Was it today or yesterday? It was yesterday. Yeah. She already had a twisted wrist and she was had a nail gun, so she said my strength was weakened. The nail gun hit another nail. What's oh. the chances of that? Pop that nail gun back in her face. She's going through some stuff. Her face is sore. Amen. <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is, is that people are going through stuff. Right, right. right? But the Lord, amen, is the Lord of our life. And he's trying to get a hold of us and he's trying to do a work in us. Amen. Let him amen. receive glory in the midst. Anyway, yes. that's, that preacher, that teacher said, if you hadn't touched their felt needs in 20 minutes, you lost them. Well, guess what? If I got to preach that way, I reached over to the preacher I was with. I said, dude, you got a problem with that? <laughs> no, man. Sounds like him. It's wow. impossible. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I got a problem with that. Yeah. 
No, she because now you're telling me I'm supposed to prepare a message for what they think they need. Right. Uh-huh. As opposed to what the Lord told me in that boring bathroom when I was Man. broke, busted, Man. and disgusted. And he said, present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. And then again, later on, five years later, don't put your grubby fingers in my word. That's just how God speaks. Right. I'm not trying to talk to you that way. I'm just telling you how you're talking to me. Don't put your grubby fingers in my word, boy. In other words, don't manipulate it. Don't try to concoct some message that meets their felt needs. Amen. No. Speak to them through my word and let them hear my word and let me deal with their hearts. Most people can't handle that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the preacher don't like that. Yeah. Come on. We're all in the same boat. Amen yes. here. He's, yeah. work, he's still working on me. Don't make me sing that song. <laughs> he's still working on me. Amen? All right. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The question's going to be answered, my friend. All the atheists, they won't be atheists anymore at that point. You get that? That's right. I, I guess, you know, I'm not going to say who, but I just got some disturbing news. Somebody called me up the other night and they said, hey, listen, there was a Bible professor of a, well, of a well-known Bible college. Now, whether or not this story is true, I haven't done the back work. And I don't, but according to this person, he said, this guy no longer is serving the Lord. He, I called him up the other day to ask him, and he told me, no, dude, I am not serving the Lord anymore. He's so smart. They didn't even talk according to this testimony. I tried to do a little bit of background re- research to see, and there seems to be some evidence that it could be true. I don't know it for sure. I wouldn't call his name out anyway. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that this dude got, got so smart that he called himself out. Wow. See, the Word of God says in Romans chapter 1 that, that their foolish hearts, that they, their wisdom made them become fools. Mm-hmm. It's one thing when the Lord gives you wisdom and intellect and you use it for His glory, Amen. But whenever you start thinking that you're smarter than the word of the Lord, or you're smarter than the Lord, and you're trying to figure stuff out at a whole other level, listen to me, and you start getting pompous and haughty, and even if the story's not true, it still is true. That's true. Right. Because if you start responding that way, he will break you back. Yes, yes. Amen. So what did I do? I prayed for the dude. Because that's what we should do. I prayed for him again this morning. Amen. Amen. Lord, please. Protect me. Don't ever let me start thinking that I figured something out. Come on. Bro. I just want to figure out. I want to. I want to keep trying to figure out Jesus, though, because that's His will that I keep seeking. And the more I seek Him, Hallelujah. it says, "Listen, every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him." I want you to see this real quick. You can go to Zechariah chapter twelve, verse ten. Zechariah twelve ten, Old Testament passage. It says, every eye will see him and also them that pierced him. This is the Lord speaking through the prophet Zechariah. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Listen, this is going to happen in the end. And they shall look upon me. This is, this, this is Old Testament prophecy. Approximately, I haven't looked at the date in a while, but approximately 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And God is saying through the prophet Zechariah to his people of Israel that there's a day coming when I'm going to pour out my spirit of grace on the, the, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son. Boy, look, that's some powerful stuff. See, God, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And six years before it was manifest, 600 years before it was manifest on the earth, God spoke to his people Israel to prepare them. To prepare them for the encounter that he would come. But yet they went to Pilate and they said, we can't do it. Would you help us crucify him? Essentially is what they did. And they pierced him. They pierced the only begotten son of God. But there's coming a day. See, just like you might not have been willing to buy in completely to Jesus at first. How long did it take for somebody to start witnessing to you before you would finally start to bend, right? Right, right. Oh, I don't know about all that. I don't know, but guess what? The Lord knows how to make that go. Oh. He knows how to make that gumbo and finally it gets you to the place where you say, look at the one that I pierced. Let me bow my knee to him. And guess what? The Lord 
knows how to prepare that type of trial also for the children of Israel to bring them to the place. We're going back to Revelation chapter 1. To bring them to the place where every eye will see. We're going back to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to go ahead and go back to verse 7. He says, Behold, he comes with a cloud. Every eye will see him. And also they which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail. And listen, I love that word kindred. It's old King James, but it means, you know what it means? If you lived in the mountains, you know, my kin, my kinfolk. And that's where the word comes from, kindreds, kinfolk, the families of the earth, the tribes of the earth, all families, all tribes, all people groups of the earth shall wail because of him. The word wail means to be the breast. It means whenever their eyes see him and they realize that they laughed at Robert and they realize they laughed at Elaine and they realize they laughed at Sabrina, when they realize that, oh my gosh, they were telling me the truth, they're going to beat their breast and they're going to wail. And look what the Lord God said. Because of him. Because they realize now it was all true. And look, even so, amen. <laughs> Can I tell you that God is a loving God? Can I tell you, you know how much he loves you? Have you not seen it in your own life? Has he not revealed to you how much he loves you in spite of you? In spite of me? Amen. Amen. But even so, amen. amen. Because see, just as grace has been so prevalent in the world, and God has been so merciful and kind, even so, judgment will also happen. That's right. Amen. So be it. Yeah. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega. That's Jesus, amen. The first, Greek letter, the first Greek letter is Alpha. The last Greek letter is Omega. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now John says, and I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. See there, I, that's the first time I ever noticed this. That's why I love studying the Bible. I love the fact that I'm a pastor. Because, and I don't ever want to stop being a pastor. And let me tell you why. And you may not like this, but I'm just going to be real with you. I'm going to be transparent. Because you know what? As the pastor, i got to study the Word of God. And guess what? And I love the Word of God. Every time I open it up and take the time, dude, this morning was so good, I just sat up and laid up in the bed this morning. And I spent about two and a half, three hours. That may not seem like a long time to you. I was just eating it out. I was like, man, look at this. And this wasn't the first time I looked at it. I looked at it a couple of days ago. And I just kept, and I just kept thinking about it as I was driving today and doing whatever I was doing. And I'm thinking, he's, he said he was my companion in tribulation. I want you to stop and think about that, American Christian. I want you to stop for a second. The word tribulation means splitsis. It means to be pressed. It's a pressure, a pressing. He was on a prison island. Why? Because he was a witness for the Lord. Because he was preaching the gospel. And what I'm trying to say is, is that I think this American gospel has put in, gotten us drunk. It's gotten us drunk. We're no longer sober spiritually. We're falling or we're getting sleepy. Paul the apostle said, don't... Those that sleep, sleep in the night. Those that get drunk, get drunk in the night. But we're not the people of the night. We're people of the light. Amen. 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 Don't walk in the night. Walk in the light. Amen. He said that he was our companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Those that have been with, with us for a while, that word patience right there, if anybody can guess what it is in the Greek, it's a word y'all should well know. Yes, thank you. What you said. Probably. <laughs> but that's good. It's a hoople moment. And those of you that have been around for a while, you know what that word means. In the Greek, it's a compound word. Hoopo under mone remain. Under remain. That means, guess what? This lion devil, this crazy world, is going to produce trial and tribulation in the midst of your life. You might have a relationship problem, you might have a job problem, you might have financial problems, you might have children problems. I promise you, at some point in time, one of them things is going to hit you. And sometimes it might hit you square between your eyes. But good news, good news. The Lord will give me grace to hoop on Monet, to remain under the trial in a God-honoring way. You don't just drag up and quit, Christian. That's right. Don't do it. Amen. By the grace of God, don't, don't, hey, listen, please pray for me. Uh, look, 
I told you a while back, I prayed, Lord, this is the first time I've prayed anything like this, Lord, weld my hands to the plow. Oh, that's, I don't know, that felt good to me when I was praying it. Because I was like, I know that Ryan Devil, he's trying to do everything he can to get a grinder out and get going on well. No, no, no. By the grace of God, you ain't unwell to nothing, Ryan Devil. Yeah. By the grace of God, I'm going to keep on keeping my hand on the plow. Yes, I'm going to yes. keep on plowing that old fallow. Preach the gospel. Present my word for the way it's written, and I will use you. Whether there's one, whether there's two, whether there's ten, whether there's 150, whether, I don't, it don't matter how many there are. I know he's called me to preach his word for the way it's written, and that's what we shall do by his grace. In the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ within the aisle that is called Patmos for the word of God, because of the word of God, because I was preaching the word of God. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about or wrapped around the path from the lower waist with a golden girdle. Look what it says in verse 14, and then we're going to go to another spot. It says, His head and his hairs were white like wool. The whiteness describes wisdom, and it describes like that song they sang last week, the Ancient of Days. I remember that song? Mm -hmm. He's the eternal one. His white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. I don't know about you, but it sounds a whole lot different than the one that they tried to blindfold. I don't think anybody's blindfolded in <coughs> Jesus. And his feet like unto fine brass as if they had burnt, been burned in a furnace. You know, it was, you know dude, this, is, this is why I love the word of God. It just, I just got a revelation. Standing up here, preaching the gospel, I just got a revelation. You ready for this revelation? I don't know if it's going to excite you like it just excited me. But thank you, Jesus. Who was the fourth person in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Then I see another as though he were the son of man in the book of Daniel. 400, 500 years before Jesus was ever on earth. And all of a sudden, I just noticed for the first time, as many times as I read the book of Revelation, that his feet were like fine brass as if they had been burned in a furnace. All I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to say that's when his feet burned in the brass. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to say, he was in a furnace, and he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he'd been through the fire. He's the faithful witness. He's the Lord of God. Amen. Hallelujah. He died for the Lord. He was resurrected again. And I'm here to tell you, Christian, that no matter what you go through, you might find yourself in the midst of a fiery furnace. Amen. Help me out. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say, I'm in a fire furnace. Yeah. I believe. Guess what? They got one that's got some brass feet. Amen. He, was with the, uh, he was with them Hebrew boys. They were, you know, remember that story? They refused to bow down. Right, right. They refused to bow down to the image of the beast. Can I say that? Yeah, I can. The golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had made and said, Hey, when you hear the lyre, the flute, the psaltery, and all manners of music, bow down and worship this golden image that I created. Mm -hmm. But they refused. And he was in the fiery furnace with them. Hallelujah. That's what he looked like. I want you to see now if you can go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. The reason that I want to, you know, I'll point this out, but. Well, we, soon we will get into the churches, and we'll finish up the churches, and then we're going to get into the seals. When that first seal is open, I'm, I like to repetitively tell you things, because the more I repeat, the more you understand, the more fluent I can talk. Amen? I mean, I believe that. I'm not trying to talk, act all big and bad. But listen, the Bible is a language. I, the Lord showed me that a long time ago. The love of God is foreign to this earth. First John chapter 3, verse 1, I believe it is. It says, what manner of love is this that you have bestowed upon us? That word manner describes a tribe. It means a foreign tribe. It came from another place. Is what I'm trying to say. The love of God comes from another 
place. Yeah. You and I, I don't care how much we know it. I don't care how much we've melted in his presence. I don't care how much he's revealed himself to us. You and I do not really, really, really understand the love of God. Hopefully every day we're understanding it a little bit better. But I'm here to tell you the love of God comes from another place. Why? Because this earth is fallen. This earth is selfish. And everything that we learn from the time coming up, it was already in us. That's why a two-year-old kid acts the way they do. It's already in them. You don't have to teach it to them. It's there. They're selfish. You and I are selfish in our hearts. Can I say that? Well, I'm going to because it's true. Your old Adamic nature is selfish. Not only that, if you're not careful, your old, your Adamic nature will try to rise up after you become a believer, and you will think that you're not selfish. And you will think that you were right. The Word of God says you ought not think more highly of yourself than what you should. Amen. It's not God's will. Amen? So look here, and let's, let's stay focused. And I saw heaven open, and I behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Amen. See, this is Jesus. Now look, when we get to the seals, the first seal that opens, there's a rider on a white horse. He's a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. That's not the one. That's the fake one. He's the Antichrist. The first seal that opens up, and it says he was given a crown. What does that mean? God is going to allow him to have his moment. His last 3.5 years, three and a half years of tribulation will mimic and counterfeit the three and a half years of ministry that Jesus Jesus is going to get a crown. The Antichrist is given a crown. He's given the ability to cause this trouble. But this is Jesus we're talking about. He's called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Think about that. His garment. It's, his garment is red. It's crimson. His royal, his, you know, the, the word about royal and, 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 and purple, it's kind of questionable when you really dig into it. It's almost like it was kind of like a crimsonish, purplish. And, and I'm just trying to say he's a king that was a shepherd that was slain. And his, his, his kingly vesture, whatever color it is, it, it says it's dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, and upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. And he has on his vesture, his garment, and on his thigh a name written. And this is what it says, King of Kings. Lord. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We're going back to Revelation 1, verse 14. We shouldn't do too much longer. It says that his feet were like a fine brass, as if they were burning a furnace. Going to verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth, there it goes, there was a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I was thinking a lot about that word stars today. I don't really have time to to break it down. There's so much to that word. But anyway, let's just keep going. And his countenance was as the sun that shines in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a good word right there, yes, my friend. Yes. Because look, you, you and I might see the grave. I mean, we don't know that the Lord, should the Lord tarry, you and I will see it. That's right. Amen? But because he rose, yes, yes. his word, he, listen, I'm going to tell you right now. Again, I can't remember if it was Martha or Mary. But she said, Lord, had you been there sooner, my brother would not be dead. She said, he said, he will rise again. And she said, I know he will in the end days. He, he, he said, no, she, he will resurrect. He said, don't you know that I am the resurrection and the life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. He that believes in, in me will never die. That's right. Hallelujah. But he will have eternal life. Yes, ma'am. It's hard to wrap your brain around that, isn't it? I mean, no, really. I mean, whenever you look at this fallen yes. world and you see the leaves turn brown, mm -hmm. they're going to be turning brown before long. You're going to get a hard season. It's coming. <laughs> and the leaves are going to start turning brown. And everything's going to look macabre. 
think that's a fancy word for the death in the dark. And so it'd be like an Edgar Allan Poe novel. You'd be driving through the swamp and you'd see everything death in the dark. But I got good news for you. That ain't the end of the story. Hallelujah. That's just a symptom of where we are right now. But mm -hmm. this, this life is temporary. I need you to know that. This life is temporary. The pain of life is temporary. I try the best that I can to try to explain it, but until the Lord gives us an anointing and helps us understand, we will try to live and focus so hard on trying to be happy in this temporary fallen world. Yeah. And God will give you joy. He will give you joy, and He will give you times of happiness, and you will see your child in that beautiful, innocent little face, and you will see other things that will happen, and He will give you victories, amen? And there's going to be times, and listen, and whenever, the more we try to walk in the will of the Lord by His grace, the more happy we will oftentimes be. But i got to tell you that this is a temporary place. That's right. Amen? amen. It's temporary, Phil. Amen. He says, Behold, I'll live alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. You know, the keys of hell and of death. The keys describe authority. I mean, you don't just give anybody a key. I mean, the people that have a key to the church, it's because we trust them in the church. We probably a couple keys out there. Key. Did you ever change the lock? We probably got a couple keys out there. But anyway, the point is, is that the keys describe authority. We trust, we trust. God, Jesus has authority. He has the authority over hell and death. Amen? Amen. Death is not going to hold you down. We've already talked about that. He is the resurrection and the life. Write the things down which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars of the angels of the seven churches. Now, this is, listen, I just want to share with you, this is my interpretation of that based upon many years of, of studying, but just because it's my interpretation doesn't make it right. right? So you, you will have to study for yourself and ask the Lord to reveal to you. The word angel, though, I do want you to know in the, in the Greek language, it's, it's spelled like, it's to Jesus, angelos. The word angel can be translated as man. Messenger. It can be translated as messenger. Yeah. It can be translated as angel. All right? Most scholars believe that this is talking about the pastors of the church. Now, I mean, I've got to tell you that I, that I do agree to a big extent of that because the whole letter was written, the whole letter was coming from God the Father and being given to Jesus through his angel and then it's given to John through the angel and then John is giving it to the servants of the Lord. So I do believe that there's a lot of truth to the fact that this word could also be translated to the pastors of the seven churches. But I also believe that there's a whole lot going on in the spiritual realm that you and I don't really completely understand. Amen? We already talked about the fact that there's fallen angels over fallen nations and that there's an archangel Michael over the, the nation of Israel. And we also already have talked about Ephesians chapter 6 and that there's varying levels militarily of angels. the principalities and the powers in these fallen angels. And, and in a similar sense, we can, we can assimilate from that that also in God's kingdom, there are angels that are at different levels. And I believe that, that there are angels assigned to churches. Amen? I mean, I can't prove that to you, but I believe it. So anyway, I believe that this is true both ways. I believe that it was a letter that was specifically intended for the seven pastors of the churches, and that also, that in the spiritual realm, there were seven churches. All right? And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. I'm closing with this because then we move on to chapter 2. But what I want you to know is, is this, is that the candlestick reminds me of the menorah. And if you know what the menorah is, it was the lampstand that was in the holy place, which was the room in the tabernacle or the temple before you walk through the veil into the holy of holies. And inside the holy place, that first room, there was a menorah or a candlestick, or that's not a good interpretation, a lampstand. All right? And every day, the priest would have to go in there and he'd have to take care of it. He'd have to trim the wicks. He'd have to fill the oil. Jesus said in, in John chapter 1, 
John, the beloved, wrote in his gospel. He said that Jesus was the light that came from heaven. Amen. And then Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He said, no man lights a candle and then hides it under a bush. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. He said, let your light shine before all men that they might see your works and glorify your Father in heaven. What is my point? My point is Jesus is the light. Jesus gave his light to the church. And in this passage of scripture, the seven churches represent the light of God. I got good, I got good news because it can only be done through the grace of God that you are the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes the only Jesus that anybody's going to see is you. That's right. Don't, listen, if you're not feeling the Holy Ghost, you need to start praying, Lord, fill me up with your spirit. Why? So you can be a witness for him. Because I'm telling you right now, my friend, you don't want to sit on the bench. But at the same time, let me say this. I've known a lot of people that aren't filled with them, that, are, that, that, that do not feel like they've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They know a whole lot of people about Jesus. I just want you to know that. And hey, listen, I'm just thankful for people that tell people about Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is beautiful. Your word is true. It reveals your heart to us, Lord, and I pray that you would help all of us that would have watched this teaching tonight or have been part of this, Lord, that we would get the revelation of Jesus Christ that we need in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make us hunger for your presence, for your will, for your word, oh Lord God, that you would use us, Lord. We understand that we're in a temporary place. We're just pilgrims on the journey. Lord God, and, and there's an eternity to embrace, Lord, we'll receive a glorified body, and we will reign as kings and priests with our Lord for a thousand years. Lord, that's what your word says. And you made us to be kings and priests, because you purchased us with your blood from every tongue, tribe, and nation upon this earth. You've purchased mankind with your precious blood, Lord. So we no longer belong to ourselves, we belong to you. We're your property. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us an understanding of that. We pray, Lord, that you would help us through your grace to surrender to your will. Yes. And I pray for your people, Lord, that showed up tonight, those that will watch on video, that you will help them, Lord. That you will help them in their tribulation. That you will give them the patience, the hupomone, Lord God, the <coughs> endurance that they need to never let go, to remain under, to hold on, to never quit. We give you glory and honor, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Let's go through. Just wait. Let me hit this one.